Hey, hey, Kids Cook Real Food, Katie Kimball here for the Healthy Parenting Connector, where we connect parents who want to raise healthy kids with the experts who have the information they need. And I'm so thrilled to bring you one of my Stress Mastery Educator colleagues here today, Sonia Lestmeister. Sonia, I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your last name. That was so cool. Hey, you welcome. just tasted. You just did great. Because <laughs> I'm an English major. Yeah, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Sonia's here because we are going to talk about the stresses and joys of a bilingual or multicultural home. I know this is a really hot topic with people who have like cross-cultural adoptions or multicultural families like immigrants to America, or maybe uh, biracial marriages, there can be a lot of really unique stressors for kids. And Sonia's gonna utilize her experience in stress mastery and her life experience as someone who is an English as a second language speaker and an immigrant to America to talk about how we can really make life smoother for our kids. I'm so excited to talk about this today. Yes, so am I, Katie. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, this is going to be so good. So, Sonia, take just a minute and kind of tell us a little bit about your background culturally, and then how did you get into stress education and stress mastery? Haha, <laughs> great question. So, my background, my home country is Czech Republic. Actually, now the most recent name is Czechia, which I don't really love. And currently, you may know it as the Czechoslovakia. So, that's where I was born and raised. And uh, came to the U.S. when I was about 23 years old. So it's been roughly 17 years I've lived here. And I am proud to say that as of last Wednesday, I have also been naturalized. So I am officially a U.S. citizen now. Yay, so, congratulations. Yay. It's been a long journey. And how did I come here and how did I become a stress mastery educator or the stress topic in general. So I came here actually on a fiance visa. So talking about stress, uh -huh. um, and you can maybe relate if you have an international adoption, there's a lot of paperwork to be done and completed and a lot of transitioning. When you're transitioning as an adult, it's different from being a child. Mm -hmm. But essentially, you're, it, it feels like you're in a um, witness protection program. You sort of come uh -huh. here. And even though you might be speaking the language like I already have, um, you don't recognize all the nuances until you actually cross that bridge. All of a sudden you find yourself in a different culture. You uh, kind of have to redo your life altogether, everything. Wow. You're, you don't know anybody. You don't know really what they eat. You kind of know what they eat when you go to grocery store. It's like, it's a, it's a trip to a different world. I mean, you recognize the produce for the most part, but the packaging is different. Trying to cook your home recipes doesn't always turn out. I remember baking Christmas cookies that turn out to be salty. And I didn't, re I didn't know at the time that there's actually salty and non-salty variety of butter, which caused that oops. Oh, and so wow. all the nuances that you don't think about until you actually live here. So that was, and you know, changing of my status, being from going from single to being married. So there are a lot of adjustments to be made. And actually it's being said that one of the top or top three most stressful events is uh, moving. The second one is, uh, you know, changing your status, social status from maybe being single to being married or me from being married to being divorced, all these. So that's very stressful. And third one is starting a new career. And I was fresh out of college looking for a job. So I had the trifecta. And on top of it, a different culture. So I had a four things going on at the same time. So it was uh, a time when I actually went through depression. I didn't know it at the time, but it was a very uh, difficult time. And being that I'm a survivor and kind of uh, adaptable type of a person and adventurous in heart, that helped a lot. Mm, and, cool. uh, you know, that kind of answers the second portion of your question, because over time, I've, I've learned to be resilient, I've kind of gathered my resources. However, as I have become a mom, and uh, being in a bicultural or bi not biracial, but bicultural relationship, it has become increasingly difficult. And the nuances that initially seemed very little and unimportant has 
kind of widened the gap over time mm. and really made it difficult. So the stress was piling up. Just imagine having a plate, like going through a buffet line and all of these responsibilities were piling up on my plate. So not only I was responsible for running a household, all of a sudden I became a house owner at some point, a mother of one, then two, and uh, having supporting then my spouse, we're no longer together, but we have two beautiful children together. And all these other things, social responsibilities, wanting to contribute in this to, to the local community, all just kind of made this big mess in my life. And I found myself not being able to cope anymore. I was burning out. Mm. And um, I am someone, and women in general are someone who need to be connected. We're connectors. We need that community. That's how we're wired. And I found myself lacking in some respect on not having enough close relationships to really help with that. So I was reaching for any straws. So finally finding helpful, effective uh, outlets led me on the on the path to, to managing and eventually mastering my stress, Katie. Hopefully that cool. answered your question. Yeah. And so now you your two boys, tell me their ages and are they also bilingual? Yes, they are. Uh, my older one, Steven, is eleven and his younger brother Sebastian is eight and a half. So okay. eight and a nine. So what have you found are some of the challenges of speaking two language languages in the American culture? Well, you know, with this whole uh, society being kind of divided about immigration, uh, it feels a little bit odd to speak a different language in public because I'm someone who likes to blend in. And I would pride myself in like, you know, being almost undetectable as, as, a, as a foreigner. And all of a sudden, you have to kind of come out and speak a different language in public because uh, from early on, you're encouraged as a parent to communicate with your child. So when you go to the grocery store or other places, point out things and speak. And all of a sudden, I had to speak my language. And actually, it was a blessing in disguise because my Czech, which is my first language, has started to deteriorate. Because I was not really speaking with anyone, there aren't very many Czechs where I live in my local community. So uh, whenever I would make a trip back home, I found myself grabbing uh, and looking for the right words to say. I, it would be difficult. And I remember when I was on the other side of the table looking at people coming back from uh, from elsewhere, I'd be like, what's your problem? Like, are you trying to just look important and all of a sudden you're not one of us? I didn't recognize that's a real challenge. So what I had to do essentially was overcome that mindset that people will judge me and they will think of me as an illegal person because that's the big divide, right? Am I an illegal? Am I here legally or illegally? And I couldn't wear a sticker saying, yes, I am legal. You know, I'm the legal alien. Uh, but I had to be okay with that, recognizing that those people don't really matter because I am the one who know who is fostering that relationship and I have a purpose for that. It's not just to be different and quirky, but really recognizing my entire family lives overseas. And in order for me to have a meaningful connection between my children and them, I needed to be proactive in keeping their heritage and their language alive because that's the connecting piece, right? If you cannot communicate, you really cannot create uh, meaningful memories. Yeah, that's very true. Now, obviously you had to make a conscious choice mm -hmm. to teach your children Czech and English. So there must be some benefits. So although there are challenges, what are the benefits of speaking two languages? Well, the benefits are immense. You know, from speaking from brand, uh, brand, excuse me, brain standpoint, mm -hmm. the language center, if I'm not mistaken, is in the same, uh, is located in the same part of the brain that is responsible for math skills, the logical skills, and even music, it's all resides in the same thing, in the same thing, same, same place. <laughs> English is my second language. So I might be pointing to the, to the wrong side. So I'm not a neuroscientist. However, it just helps really to express yourself much better you have multiple outlets so even though i'm not a musician i can really um, enhance my brain functioning and really give your brain some workout and initially 
uh, when actually as a child, you are, you are born into this world, your brain is an open book and you can truly learn any language. And you're not learning, you're just, uh, you're absorbing it. So you can, if you have trilingual household, your brain would essentially look for patterns. It's looking for patterns in the language. Each language has its own pattern. So if you have only English speaking family members, the brain will slowly weed out all the sounds that don't make up that pattern. So if you have two languages, the brain will start to pick up on the two patterns that are going on. And the benefit really was when my kids started to speak. I, and from the very beginning, I uh, basically committed to speaking only Czech with them. And so the other parents and the other family members would speak their language. And you can, there are many ways you can do it, and I'll talk about it in a bit. But essentially, by me uh, being associated with the same language, I remember when my kids would try to say something, and I wasn't sure what they're saying. I would say, say the Czech, say that in English. And so we would go back and forth until we figured out what they're saying. So it was a benefit because I didn't have to guess. Because, you know, my I remember one time my younger son was saying mommy teddy is broke teddy is broke i was like who broke teddy who and who is teddy and what he was trying to say in his broken check there is a bug here there's a bug here <laughs> and so that was pretty amusing but uh, you know kind of figuring out what language we're using right now was priceless that's funny. So it's good for yeah. the brain, good for connections good. with, you know, your extended family. Also a little bit helpful when they're toddlers and you don't know what they're saying. You get two exactly. options instead of one. Exactly. So it helps with their schooling down the road, their language skills, their math skills, their music skills. Both of my kids happen to be musically gifted. And uh, my younger son is also very good at math. He's scoring really high in math on, on a national level when they're doing their testing. And it is not really true that when you're bilingual that your speech is delayed. My kids would be prime example because my older son didn't really start speaking. I remember he was about 18 months and he could only say the animal sounds. Now, you know, what does cow say? What does dog say and he would he would know it in both languages but that's about where he was where his younger brother was actually stringing three word sentences so i remember having this like little person by my leg and we would have these pretty advanced conversations for that age so that was unique and i just wanted to point out uh you know if you're someone who is looking to kind of be bilingual this is a great book raising a bilingual child there are multiple books on amazon that actually i started looking at i was like wow this is pretty cool i love books but one is enough and the two uh takeaways that i i kind of adopted from that book was one you can either associate the language with the place where you're at so if the family is at home we only speak say spanish and when we're outside the home we speak english However, my challenge with that is, well, what is home? How do you define home? And what if you're on vacation? Then the other language suffers. So, and, or if you move homes, what does that look like? Or what if the family all of a sudden splits? Say the parents divorce, what happens then? So instead, uh, the other approach was associate uh, the language with the person. So if I am a Czech speaker, then I will always be speaking Czech with you. And if your dad is an English speaking person, they will always communicate English. And that to me was easier because we didn't have to worry about definition of home. Mm, okay. And then as your boys have grown, mm -hmm. are you still Czech only or do you switch it up now? We're mostly Czech, uh, okay. but not always because sometimes there are friends around and that's another challenge. So when you are on play dates and you speak, Eng uh, you know, everybody speaks English and here I am speaking Czech, even though I'm fully capable of speaking English. I know that some moms in the past have been offended by that mm. because they didn't understand why I was doing what I was doing. Now that they're older and they have friends over, I could switch sometimes to speak English. Uh, sometimes my boys or when I'm really, you know, because my boys tendency is to speak English. That's their first language because they naturally live here. So that would be 
you know, the operating their immersion yeah. friends most of the time. So uh, sometimes when I get really annoyed by them speaking English too much, when they say something English to me, instead of saying check please, because I don't like to be an egg, I would respond in English. And they go, mom, you're speaking English. You're supposed to be speaking Czech. It and throws so, them off. How funny. So they switch. They switch and they go, okay, fine. And sometimes they say, but I don't know how to say that. So I'd say, go talk to your brother. Go figure it out. So a little bit tough on them, but challenging them in what they can do and finding ways to support that Czech language, even though it's really hard. Some languages are easier and more accessible. There's more Spanish. Mm -hmm. Uh, material in libraries and uh, TV even and, and schools, but some languages are tougher. So you have to be more resourceful and creative. Sure, yeah. I mean, now you talked about some of the social pressures and awkwardness, and I think there are always a lot of myths surrounding anything that we don't understand. So what are some myths about dual language speakers? Well, one of them was, like I said earlier, that because you're a bilingual speaker, you will not start speaking as early, but that's not true. It has to do more with your personality. My older son is more reserved and he's more like sit back and observe until you feel comfortable doing anything. And I picked up on that only because I watched him when he would be facing something new. He would always take more time. So including that language. So it has nothing to do with that. And if you have and sometimes well-meaning speech pathologists or speech therapists would advise to sidestep that second language effort in order for them to get the speech going. So I would recommend finding a speech pathologist or speech therapist that is actually versed in bilingual uh, speaking because they understand that differently. Because sometimes that effort will then squelch the second language and you will never come back to it. Mm. Sometimes okay. I, I've seen Czech families or families who speak only the, the foreign language, the second language, they would um, try to speak English at home so that they would bring balance approach. But my heart breaks for that because uh, in a sense, they are robbing their child off of the experience of really having that other language because that mm -hmm. that's the only counterpart so if you are i don't know um portuguese speaking family to speak english at home when it's your own second language is difficult because that child then doesn't understand what it feels like what it sounds like and the effort to assimilate with the rest of the the majority culture then kills that true heart, because that's your heart language, right? Mm -hmm. If the family expresses their love and everything, their passion, and some cultures are more passionate, say Italians, are very passionate, Madonna, Madonna mia, you know, all that, it's, it's big. And then it, you lose that, so yeah. you don't want that. So the Another myths can myth, go in both directions, kind of. They can be, oh, absolutely. we shouldn't speak two absolutely. languages, or like, oh, we need to, you know, they, they kind of go you, each, each way. Right, so understanding that the child's brain is very pliable and you don't need to teach him English because by default, the brain will make that connection. And there are programs to help them outside if English is your second language. Schools have that everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I would say focus your effort on really enhancing your native tongue, you know, whatever that non-English language is. So those yeah. would be two myths. And, uh, you know, there would be other ones. Sometimes people, when they hear other people speak in different language, the assumption is that they're here illegally or the, having suspicion. You know, it's a different culture. Where are they coming from? Are they? And sometimes, sadly, it's even associated with not being smart enough just because mm -hmm. you cannot ex express yourself well mm -hmm. or talking down to you like, you know, and that's, and that would be any culture. I think my culture would look at it the same way. So kind of like setting aside your assumption that may be faulty in an effort to kind of un understand first and giving them the benefit of doubt and, and not acknowledge that you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, I like that. That's an important reminder for all of us when it comes to many differences, not to judge and assume. Now, how about families who adopt from other countries? So, I mean, there we're talking like 
probably the parents have English as their only language and the child may have another language as their primary, their only language. Are there any stress reducing strategies for those Absolutely. parents to give their children. Yeah, because it's a huge, Absolutely. a huge stressor. It is important to have a support group because, and learn about the other culture. And it also depends how, on the age of your child because it's different when you're adopting the baby mm. because that baby, you know, as we said, the brain is very plastic at that age and it can truly pick up the language and it will probably forget the first language because if they come, say, from orphanage, they haven't been really given that much attention and they will not remember. Mm -hmm. So that will be different from someone that is older. I've talked to families that have adopted at different ages. And the older the child gets, the more difficult it gets because it's uh, you have to work on, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Attachment. Mm -hmm. Because those children often are very independent. They have to be independent by default because they don't have the attention. Uh, the one mom that I spoke with said, you know, my son was about two and a half years old. And I remember he was tripped. He was running down the steps and he tripped up and fell. You know, I, I was worried that he'd, he'd start crying. And, and so I was watching for the reaction. And he just kind of picked himself up, dusted off and went on because he was used to not having that attention. Oh. So crying for mom was not an option. That would be typical for other kids of his age. So working on that, uh, attaching to the parent, attaching to the language, but also when they're older, enhancing the second language. So having, you know, maybe seeking families from similar cu culture, you know, that child was adopted from Haiti. So we begin into his story. What's his story? How unique that is. And to whatever extent they're willing, because the children may have bad memories from that. So kind of allow time to heal it. Counseling is a great thing, you know, as a stress reducing strategy. Having, find a connection with other families that have gone through that because they, they might be a great support. Or if you come from family that has adopted, that's a great, great strategy. And in general, just allowing enough time and, and having, uh, if you are new to counseling or any coaching, accept it as not as a broken thing or there's something wrong with you, mm -hmm. but allowing that benefit of counseling or coaching for your entire family is a great thing because it just allows for a healthy dynamic in the family and not being rigid because every child is different. Every child has a different story. And even with biological children, we're all different. And we are like microcultures within the new culture of our family. Mm -hmm. And having That's something cool. that binds us, like, like having meals together. She was saying, you know, eating meals together was a, a great deal. It was a connecting piece. And I'm sure you can speak to that, having family meals when when all of a sudden that's that's the common denominator we get together we get to eat together and sure thing yeah and you know yeah. there are some cross cultural differences and challenges there too when you talk about food Absolutely. what what kind of issues come up at the table when you have people from different cultures gathering together again it depends on the child child's age so if they're older you know recognizing that you will never be able to recreate their uh the food that they're used to mm -hmm. and depends where they came from if it was an orphanage that was poor maybe you know their appetite is not really there but uh and trying to you know cook american chinese the the, the original chinese will never be as good as or the Amer uh, uh, Chinese American will never be the same as the home cooked meal somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But chances are the children didn't really have all the luxuries of experiencing the food. It makes it a little bit easier. But uh, I would say it's mostly, it's not so much about food as we were worried initially or as I was thinking, but it's mostly making sure the child is adapted well by the siblings. If you have older siblings, then having a conversation, that's another stressful thing because you might feel at some point like, I don't matter. I used to have all these rituals with mom and dad. And now here's a new brother or sister and I don't have that tuck in the night. I don't have that, that, that time stories. So having uh, 
parents were saying, my, you know, having a meeting with the family, with everybody, and including the kids and say, this is what we feel we're called to do. If you have, you know, a faith background that, you know, some moms were saying, God is calling us to adopt. And we feel that this is the right thing to do. And we want to kind of go with that. And let's embrace it as a family and talk about what it might look like. So that can reduce the stress on kids if they're you know, depending on their ages and yeah, talk I'm, about that. I'm sure awareness and conversation with the children mm -hmm. who are already in the family is like a huge, like most of exactly. the equation there. Exactly. Yeah. And when you're in the process of adoption, it actually, it's not so much cooking meal for the newly adopted child, but maybe bringing the flavor of the culture we're bringing the child from to the, to our table before the, the sibling mm -hmm. comes is, uh, an interesting way to kind of bring it closer. This is where they're coming from. This, this sure. was their home and it wasn't very happy. So we're providing a loving family for that boy or girl. Yeah, so, what a beautiful practice. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of the, the act of gathering around the table, even food aside, there can almost be a language of what's appropriate and what's not yeah. when it comes to table manners. Have you found when you, you know, go back to the Czech Republic with your boys, that there's a like a food language, a table language difference there. Yes, yes. Thank you for bringing it up. That's that's my <laughs> pet peeve, but I'm trying to tame down recognizing that the cultural differences are here and there. So in my culture and in Europe, more, or more in general, Germany or France, the kids are expected to behave well at the table, and you know, recognizing that they're kids, so we're training them, or but we're not. We're training them to become um, very proficient at table matters. So using your fork and knife, knowing how to use it, N not using, it kills me when I see somebody using the fork and like forking, you know, the pizza or meat with, you know, I, I just go, ah, this is. So that's an American oh, that's thing. An American and that's a, no, no, no go in the European issue. No, 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 no. <laughs> and also just recognizing that we're, we're trying to empower the kids to, to learn to cut meat or whatever food for themselves. So not always like running and cutting every piece, you know, depending on their age, but allowing them to, to experience, with, experience with food, experiment, excuse me, with food and trying to, fortunate for themselves and be confident at the table. So it's not so much child centered, but it's, I don't want to say grown up centered, but just prepping them to be confident adults when it comes to how to use silverware. You know, what's appropriate? Is it appropriate to talk with full mouth? Do you want to chew with your mouth open? What is, you know, different cultures have different habits. I, I think one of the Asian cultures, it's impolite when you finish all your meal. In another culture, it's actually rude if you don't belch. So burping and belching is a sign of appreciation. Isn't that funny? But My grandfather always okay used to say at, at our table. You know, using tablecloths where, or just having a, a pleasing table setting is another thing. Or um, there was another thing that I'm just, I can't remember, but okay. yeah. But it is, it is, it's almost like there's a language of mm -hmm. table manners as well, which is, yeah. this is an important note, P.S., for people doing international travel mm -hmm. to really pay attention and try to figure out what's polite and what's impolite, because likely most of our American traditions are impolite, probably, everywhere else. And we, we're not too loud when we're at the table, so we have a conversation, but it's not, it's not loud, but typically I remember living back home and observing American tourists, most of them were very loud. So they would just overpower the rest of the room. Oh. And so it's not really a jab, but that's just an observation that um, I've gathered. And I've tried because of where I come from, serving my kids meals that they're not familiar. So I'm not a fan of serving kids meals like the mac and cheese and Me neither. And yay. I, I like to expose them to all the different flavors, recognizing that when they come visit my home country and will be visiting multiple homes, my culture is very hospitable. So they would cook meals and they go to all sorts of trouble to bring you whatever on the table. So if somebody does all these things for you because of the, their care and love, and then you just go, I don't want that. 
it looks gross. First of all, it's rude to say, and second of all, you haven't tried that. So I'm trying to encourage that and always say, try a few bites. You don't need to love what I cooked, and it's okay, but just say thank you and recognize that I have put my energy, time, and care so that I can feed you. So recognize that in others, and you don't need to eat, finish the meal. Nobody's saying that you have to. You just eat some and be appreciative, and that's right. all. Widen that palate. And that's, I mean, Absolutely. culture and language aside, I think that's so important for every family to do to expose their kids to different flavors and, you know, really encourage them to be open mm -hmm. and not be rude. Yeah, we right. talk about that a lot here at Kids Cook yeah. Food for sure. Because their taste buds are still developing anyway. So my kids, for example, don't like raisins. But I still I ignore that and I and I keep when I have a recipe with raisins, I still include that ingredient in. Because I say, well, you never know when you might like that combination. Just because you didn't like it in X, Y, Z doesn't mean that you will not like it in something else. And I was right because I was baking a Czech strudel, which had apples and other things. So it's a sweeter pastry, but it's not super sweet. And lo and behold, my younger son was just eating the whole thing. Because for one, it was too much work to pick them out. And second of all, all together, it worked pretty well. So uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. we like... We like that growth mindset. You don't right. like this yet, but you might later. Right. Um, so Sonia, we've talked about your own home where you have two languages. We've talked about sort of international adoptions. What of the homes where the parents don't speak the language of the culture? So maybe the parents live in America, the family lives in America, and the parents only speak their primary language, but the children have learned to speak English. I think there are some unique stressors there what what kind of stress there does a are. child experience there are i used to mentor actually a woman from somalia and a lot of the refugees they come at maybe older age and they might have children who come with them or they're born in america mm -hmm. so they get proficient in english very quickly first of all because the brain is still very pliable and they can adapt the language they're not even learning it they're they're absorbing and they're assimilating it Mm, so funny. it's a different process in the brain. And uh, when they say, you know, they're in school, growing up in a different culture, my school experience was di very different from um, the school experience that I have here. So it feels threatening at times for the parent because, first of all, you don't understand everything. If your English is not, not very good, you're not proficient, that's your first kind of a stumbling block. And second of all, you don't fully operate in this culture. You don't understand the schooling because back home, you know it. You mm -hmm. are you are capable. But here, your parenting is kind of uh, reduced because all of a sudden, you cannot pass on the experience. You cannot be the guide. You cannot help them with, help them with home, uh, home, uh, homework. Mm -hmm. I remember at one, one time, I was even considering homeschooling, but then I felt like... I cannot really uh, explain certain concepts in English and, and feel confident. So you as a parent feel less than sometimes. You okay. feel not capable enough. It's stressful. It's yeah. sad. It's very emotional. And the kids then, sometimes you feel like you don't, know, you don't know if you can trust what they're telling you because you don't know. So you, you don't feel fully in charge of your kids and you feel like you're losing them sooner than you want it. And okay. what I found helpful is being fluid, maintaining the, maintaining your fluid and flexible mindset, understanding and recognizing that it will not be the same as if you are at home, finding a support of other like-minded people, whether they speak your language or not, and join forces with them. So you can kind of bounce ideas off of each other and find that network that will help you because when you're in different culture, you have to rebuild your support network and it's very crucial, especially for moms. Yeah. Because we we need that connection and we need uh, we need that for ourselves, but even as a parent. So as a parent and as a person, you you need that mm -hmm. much more so than um, our male counterparts would. Uh-huh. Now how can is there anything teachers or neighbors can do? Like if I'm an English speaker and and I'm involved with a family where the parents don't speak English. Is there anything I can do to help them out or help the child be, you know, find a less stressful situation? Great question. I think there is a lot of help that our neighbors can uh, offer. Oftentimes I feel that they don't know how, but you can start by maybe having um, a neighborhood um, cookout. 
you know, so invite the new neighbors over. So, and everybody, we did it one year when uh, I joined forces with another lady who used to do that here in the neighborhood. And we basically printed out flyers and uh, people had sign up sheets so they could call in or drop in and say, hey, this is what I'll bring. So everybody will bring something and encourage the new family that is from a different culture to bring it and learn maybe a couple words of their language. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's always very heartwarming when the other person from the majority culture learns a couple, couple words. I saw a story when a family, they were not even a foreign speakers, but they had a deaf child. So they had to speak um, sign language. And the neighbors actually have learned sign language so they could communicate could communicate with that little girl. And that means so much for the family and so much for the girl because you don't feel alone. That sure. Really means- and that's so easy to do with yeah. the internet now. You can say, right. hey, Google, how do I say right. whatever? Right. <laughs> or you, can, you know, if you have younger children and you have moms, similar, you know, stages of kids, maybe invite them over for coffee. Don't start with a meal that might be challenging because you don't know, do they eat meat or is it offensive to them? It's, it's hard. There are a lot of layers to that culture. Yeah. So starting maybe with a coffee and saying, bring something you would like to share and I will share. So you exchange and you can have a little conversation about, you know, what is it like? Where do you come from? What do you like to eat? What's appropriate for you? So it's you can okay be to use, uh, utilize the child as the translator if the adult absolutely. Like, you know, at all. A lot of a lot of people actually do. You know, coming back to the previous questions, many families have to rely on the child translating between, yeah. say, the school and the parents, which is really uncomfortable situation because you know you don't know if they're telling you the mm-hmm. truth or are yeah. they really twisted? is there there's not much a teacher can do in that situation to reduce the no, stress I, other than just be patient and right things down. so the teachers really need to find ways to communicate nowadays you can actually have a google translate on the phone so you can either speak or type it and it will translate it's not the most convenient but it's it's a new tool that didn't really exist in my time not that i needed it so much but at least helping to communicate on a certain level that helps that's true some that's schools in california i think offer more translators even so there is a different they more accommodate different cultures which can be crazy you know when you just take it to an extreme i i cannot imagine how you do that but just finding your resources as a school so that yeah. you can, you know, be doing the right by the family and the child. Exactly. So, Sonia, I'd love to leave parents with a message of hope and something positive to leave with. Of course, you and I know that positive thoughts are so important for our brains. So we want to end on that. Yeah. What's What's your message of hope that you want people to remember out there just about bilingual homes and multicultural homes? It takes It takes a village to really make a great world. And each of us matter. So it doesn't matter what language you speak. Just remember to be kind and be patient. And realize that you don't know what you don't know. Don't assume that you know about your neighbors or other cultures. And try to make a meaningful connection. Whether you are the culture that is new coming to America, uh, be humble, but also don't, don't try to stay to yourself like be be outgoing and those of you who are welcoming new neighbors from different countries keep that open mindset and show them love and sometimes inviting over to someone's home is really the best gesture you can do i know it's hard because this culture is very loving and, and very warm on the first contact but we're not always so quick to invite somebody to our home and it can feel lonely when somebody say hello and they're nice, but they only stop at that. Mm. So kind of making the next step, whether it's comfortable or not, sometimes it's uncomfortable, but try little by little what's comfortable so that we all can feel like this is our community mm-hmm. instead Beautiful. of theirs and yours. Yes, beautiful. Important reminders really for any neighbors in any culture. It's harder and harder, I think, to connect in person now, but we got to get over ourselves and get over worries about a clean house and just step out of our comfort zone and do it. So thank you so much for joining today, Sonia. My pleasure. Awesome. You'll be able to find Sonia online at stresscoatsonia.com and we'll share that link anywhere we share this video.
I'm Katie Kimball for Kids Cook Real Food, and we'll be back next week with more expertise to help you raise those kids healthy on the Healthy Parenting Connector. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for having me.